Welcome to the interlude with Drew. Hey, what's going on, everybody? So today I'm posting the interview that I did a little while back with the late Paris Bowens. And man, it really feels crazy to say late Paris Bowens because I still can't believe that he's no longer with us. Um, I remember that Saturday morning when I got the news, I woke up uh, and checked my phone really quick to see what time it was. It was probably about like 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning. And I saw a text from one of my friends saying that Paris Bones had passed away. And I really couldn't believe it, but it hit me like a ton of br bricks. Um, I knew he was dealing with COVID, battling with uh, COVID-19. And I just truly believed that God was going to heal him and God was going to restore his health. But, you know, God had other plans. God healed him in eternity. And I, I, I truly believe that he got his crown. But he left behind a great legacy. He was a great man. He accomplished many great things, as you'll hear in this interview. Um, I remember I met him back in 2015. My family group, the McCains, was open up for Israel Houghton and uh, James Fortune. And it was an outdoor concert, but strangely enough, like it was, it was weird. We were there for a long time. Not a lot of people showed up at all. But I finally got to meet Paris Bowens. And it was a great thing because, you know, knowing the history of Ty Tribbett and GA and Soundcheck, all the great things that they accomplished, the history they made. But you wouldn't know that by meeting him because he was so humble. He's so down to earth. He talked to us for a long time. And, it, it, you know, it was such, such a pleasure to, you know, be able to meet such a giant in music like him. And, you know, ever since then, we've been in contact through social media and texts and stuff like that and just talking. He's always uh, encouraging, always, you know, loving and everything like that. And, man, just somebody I, I truly look up to as, you know, a... a Someone that was passionate about God, someone that loved God, and you know, some you know, he left behind, like I said, a great legacy, and we still are learning from the lessons that he was sharing while he was here on the earth. So I pray that this um, interview will bless you, that you'll take the things that he was saying to heart, you'll enjoy it, and you know, we'll all celebrate the memory of Paris Bones. Love you, man. What's up, everybody? This is the interlude with Drew. This is Andrew McCain, your host, and I'm here with a very special guest, one of the greatest keyboard players, producers of all time, one of my favorites. He's a legend in my book and in everybody else's book at this point, the Paris Bowens. Man, What's up, Paris, bro? My God. <laughs> Thank you I'm so honest, much bro. for being, being a part of this, man. Like, when I tell you guys, um, in my experience, most of the musicians and artists I've met have been humble. But like when I, when I, if I got to make a top of the list, nobody's more humble than Paris, man. Oh, Paris man. is another level of just humility. He's personable. And the crazy thing, I've only met him in person once, but it feels like we brothers just, just yeah. off the many times we get to talk and stuff like that. And yeah. he, he's always willing to give advice, always willing to help people. So this is a true honor and a blessing to have this interview with him. Oh man, I'm, I'm glad to be here, bro. You, you already know y'all like family to me, man. So. Yes, sir. I'm just man. excited to share with you and uh, love everything you do, bro. So Thank just glad so to be much. here. Yes, sir. So I want to start off by asking, how was 2020 for you personally and professionally? Oh, man. Um, 2020 was, man, it's a year. It's um, personally started off rough. No, I'll say this. 2020 started off good, actually. Mm -hmm. Like for real, for real. We thought 2020 was going to be lit, like Nam. I we had just done Nam, was getting ready to do some different things like that. I had just launched launched my band, and we like started doing some shows already. Yeah. And um, I remember, man, I had done some traveling, and we came. I came back from Sweden in February, and I'm hyped, like, yo, we about to put these dates on the books, and then everything shut down. Yeah. So at that point, man, you talking about depression wanted to come in, like. Like real talk, like I was, yo, I'm about this shroud of darkness, just, you know, looking at the news and seeing the words pandemic and coronavirus on a screen every day, started really kind of, you know, like, felt like the walls were coming in. And I never forget, I just kind of like took a moment, went to, I said, man, let me go into this, this prayer closet and let me see what God got to say. Cause I'm like, yo, I don't, I, you know what I mean? Don't, I, you don't want to be under this. So I went to the Lord, like, yo, what in the world do we do? And he said, 
Keep your mind on me and I got you. If you keep your mind on me, I got you. And so I'm like, we heard the scripture. Keep your mind, you know, he'll keep you in perfect peace. You keep your mind stayed on him. But he was like, literally do that. So from that point, I shut the news off. I start turning things off. And I just kind of like, when I would get into a place of anxiety, I would go to prayer. Just go to that place. Turn on worship music. And when I did it consistently, once I started realizing the atmosphere in my house, it started changing. And I began to have peace. And so personally, I was able to overcome depression and stuff like that by actually engaging with God, like, like what he said, like doing it. And then professionally, things start picking up. Like, you know, when everything shut down, a lot of people weren't getting work. I actually ended up doing a lot more work, more, um, because what happened is at that time, a lot of different ministries, a lot of different people needed help figuring out how they was going to navigate through their ministries online. So I ended up starting helping more and more people and it became an opportunity. And I'm like, oh shoot, you know, it, it ended up turning into his own business in a sense. Yeah. So it got, it, that became incredible. And then it allowed me the time to actually start working on projects that, you know, we all were too busy to work on. So it slowed us down enough to, let me finish writing the record. Let me finish the artwork. Let me finish the book. So I've been working on my project, man. This new project I've been working on has been crazy. Um, I'm, man, it's probably my favorite thing that I've done in, in quite some time. So um, it's been 2020. It started off rough, but it ended up being a very, a very good thing. All things work together. And it's kind of, it's one of those types of deals. So yeah, bro. Yeah. So on, on YouTube, I see that you recently released a song called You Are Good. And those of you watching, if you haven't checked it out, please go do that. I love that song. Um, can you talk about how that song came about? Because I know you were talking about starting the band and working on a project and stuff like that. Yeah. So it's not out yet, but the, but you're, there's stuff, there's content about it out, but it'll be out in the uh, in the in the February. Um, okay. So what happened was I did a performance for a church and I ended up performing it, um, and it ended up like they posted it and it ended up becoming. I'm like, okay, so it's out there now before yeah, the single yeah. drops, which is cool. Like, I'll take all of it, but um. It came during the pandemic, actually. That was one of the songs that that just kind of in worship time, it was in the pandemic. Uh, during the pandemic, I was up like two, man. You know, now I know musicians during the pandemic, we probably did not sleep. Like, right. <laughs> two to, I started, I would start tracking at 12 a.m. Yeah. and then be up till six in the morning. And then I'm sleeping during the day. Like, it would be backwards for me. So I remember just being up one night from about 2 a.m. to 6 and it just seems like this whole album dropped on me wow. all at once. Like from top to bottom, I'm writing. I'm, I just put record on, turn the mic on, push the push red for all my keyboards and just let it play. And then by the time I woke up the next morning, I had like a whole record. And at the end of the whole record was You Are Good. That was the last song that came. Wow. And it was just it just was the one song that had that vibe to it. And so I immediately sent it out the files out to the band like, yo, y'all got to jump on this. Um, I don't know if you know about my drummer, Quasi, uh, Quasi Robinson. I'm like, he was the last person to jump on. My bass player, guitar player, everybody else got on it. I'm like, Quasi, I need your files, bro. So he finally sent the files in and then I kind of start posting a little bit about it. But it was basically, the song is basically like, God is not, like, no matter what happened, God is not surprised by what's going on. So he remained good, even though all of this stuff seems crazy. He's navigating this thing. And as long as we let him stay in the driver's seat, that's the whole concept. If he's in the driver's seat, we're not lost. No matter what, we can't see what's in front of us, but God is not lost. So yeah. I just wanted to put that song out as an encouragement throughout what we're going through. And we're still in it. Like, obviously, we got a new president. Mm -hmm. Everything is still, you know, we all say Happy New Year, but we're still a little bit in it. Yeah. But I feel like if God is not showing himself faithful to us, those of us can't say we've lost a lot of people last year. But those of us who have made it through, we know God's been faithful, so he's still good and his mercy endures forever. So that's the message of the song. It's really an encouragement, like, yo, we're going to keep trekking through no matter what's going on. And he got us covered no matter what. So just keep a smile. You know what I mean? That's the whole vibe. Yeah, man. Yeah, I, I, like I said, I I really love that song. Like, it's it's a vibe with a message. So that's like right yeah. up my right up my alley. Exactly. Yeah. Y'all got, so, got a song. I'm not even going to... Y'all join. I saw on Kevin Powell, uh, he posted... Y'all join, man. Y'all, McCain's, y'all killing, bro. Like, bro, appreciate that. I want to get y'all on something. <laughs> we oh, got to something. Yeah, we got to, man. Yeah, for sure, man. Yeah, we got the, you got the mic and all that. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. 
Yeah. So the band Tiny Spicy Chicken. So how did you guys come together? And then can you share the story of where the name came from? <laughs> so that so literally, um, man, wow, this time last year, we get get ready for Nam. Um at that point, I just kind of invited some friends to play, like, yo, are you gonna be at Nam? You're gonna be at Nam, you gonna all right, jump on with me, rock out with me. So the, the week before we did Nam, I like didn't even know how I was getting to Nam. Like literally. I hadn't got my flights, nothing. And um, I got called last minute to come do a gig out in Louisiana, mm. real random. And it they paid me exactly what I needed to get my plane ticket, everything. Wow. So when I got there, um, the gig didn't go, go so well. It was like, I feel like God just set it up just so I get the name of the band and I get what I needed to get the name. Mm -hmm. But the gig didn't go good at all. The sound was horrible. We were supposed to do 45 minutes. We had to get on stage in 15 minutes. It was just, oh, wow. you talking about 5,000 plus people. It was just like, and so the artist, she was apologizing to me. I'm like, don't worry, it's all good. I'm like, it's about the fellowship. So he's like, let's go eat while we wait for them to finish. Mm -hmm. It was like, it's this restaurant. They got something called Tiny Spicy Chicken. It's really good. And I'm like, I don't really eat everybody's, I don't trust everybody's food. So I was like, if it's good, I'm going to name the band after it. And if it ain't, Y'all, it's on y'all. So we went, needless to say, the food was crazy. Um, I was like, so the band is gonna be called Tiny Spicy Chicken. So we got the name. I didn't know what to, I didn't know what to call the guys that was with me. And I was like, oh yeah, it's just Tiny Spicy Chicken. And just kind of threw it out there. Oh. And I'm just joking, yeah. but everybody loved it. They just kind of like, yo, that's a dope name. And it just kind of picked up. Yeah. So when I came home, I just called my homies like, yo, why don't y'all be kind of like, you know, joining with me with this band with Tiny Spicy and um, here's some new music I'm working on. Just, just kind of jump on. So Quasi, Zane, Richie, my girl Hane, my brother Brett. We all they all jumped in, and um, we just start kind of rocking out during the pandemic. Literally, I think we did like one good show, and then the pandemic hit, oh. and it was like, oh, you got to be kidding me! And, it, and we had the show was smacking. We like let's take this. You know, we we ready to go and. Everything got shut down. So we didn't even get to do anything officially um, since we named it. But we have recorded over the, you know, 2020 for some other artists. We've done five sessions and stuff like that. And then I got like this new record, the You Are Good song. That's going to be the first single we're going to release. Um, and then I'm going to put an EP out, hopefully top of second quarter. Um, it's going to be crazy, though. So, you know, that's kind of how it all came about. Man, that's amazing. So uh, speaking of NAM 2020, so you, I believe that was your first time uh, performing in a Nord booth and you did an incredible job. Um, I, I, I was really happy to see it because I know that you've had a Nord for some time and you you really enjoy their product. So yeah. to be sponsored by yeah. them and kind of be able to share their platform, how was that experience? Man, it was amazing. Um, it's weird because with with them, people are like, yo, how you connect to them? I, every like, yo, social media is so new. Is I come from an older generation, so my mindset is everything is is um, you know, handshake network. You meet people in real life. This whole new social media thing is completely new to me. Oh, yeah. Um, so when they reached out to me, I'm thinking they reached out to me based on the stuff they've known me to do, and they were reaching out to me simply because of social media, like because every time I would post a video, I would just tag Nord, but it wasn't because I had an, a deal. Mm -hmm. It was just, just the social media push. Like, let me just hashtag them. So they reached out to me like, you want to perform? And I'm like, absolutely, yeah. So we did, when I did the NAMM situation, I think what's unique for me is I'm used to playing for other people. I'm used to doing, I, I did NAMM before with Israel and stuff like that. So I'm used to performing and seeing other people's names. It was weird walking up to a booth, seeing a, your name on the roster, like, yo, I'm not here for Israel, Ty, for anybody else. I'm here for me. When I first walked up, dog, I almost freaked out. Like, okay. I can imagine. It, it was like, you know what I mean? And I think most of the musicians, when I talked to like Glenn and some of the other guys, all of us are used to playing for somebody else. Right. It's another thing when you walk up and you're the featured talent. And in church, we grew up, we church, we're told we the a company, we backed, you know, musicians, we're on the side, we in the pit, we in the corner. 
But in that arena, it was the first time I walked up on the stage and saw my name. Like, yo, Cash is here to see me play. And, you know, I had to get past the nerves first. Like, yo, she's seeing Joker's line up waiting while you setting up. Like, yep. so I clown when I'm nervous, I clown. <laughs> I, got, I yeah. joke and do stuff. Yeah. So I try to go church a little bit and say stuff to come on. Bless, I try to do little stuff like that. And so once I did that, you start playing, you kind of got out of your nerves. And then it, it was cool. First set, I felt a little nervous. Second set, I was I felt a lot better. Um, and then, of course, we had sound issues. You already know, like, out there, you're competing with sound ordinance, ordinance and stuff. Yep. Yep. So you can't play so loud. So they, the sound guy bringing you down, you like, oh man, I'm, like, ready to swing because I can't feel what I'm doing. But, yeah. but yeah. the response was incredible. And I was introduced to even a new audience as well because I'm used to church. Yep. We used to each other. Um, it's, it's another thing you meet people from other countries that's like you're hearing your music for the first time and making a connection. Uh -huh. So it was definitely, um, it was amazing. It was something that made me, it made me want to do it more. You know what I mean? I think it made me say Paris, like you need to really launch out and really step out into, into this. We, a lot of us, man, we, we have the ability to do it, but we don't because we don't, we don't usually get the push. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Um, we're told to back somebody up and, if they got the vision, you back their vision. But sometimes God puts something in you and it takes moments like that. And it was it was definitely a fear moment. But once once I did it, I'm like, okay, it's time to do it some more. Do it more. We got a voice. We got a platform. And it's time to get out there and do it. So it, it definitely encouraged me to do it. And, and then the, the pandemic happened. I was like, God, like. Right, right, right. You know I mean, I was ready to get, get out into the water some more. But yep. I think God was like, I think necessarily God was like, yo, hold up. Build up your content. Build up your catalog. Yeah, yeah. Now yeah. when everything opened back up, you ready? I have something to bring. You know, what I mean, a little bit more official. So, it was amazing, though. It was definitely a life changing experience. That's good. All right. So now, so we talked about kind of the present. Let's go back to the beginning. So, how did you start? I know you've been playing keys for a long time. How was your your start and your beginning and playing piano and everything like that? Man, it started with dad. Man, um, I'm a PK, so. It was like my dad was my dad was the minister in Philly backing himself up on the organ. Oh. He had a mic on the organ, preaching, playing from the organ. You know what I mean? Oh. So okay. um, he always had a, we always had a hard time getting a keyboard player. So I'll never forget my dad pulled me aside. I'm like 10. He like, yo, you got to learn to play to help. And immediately started teaching me. I mean, teaching me basic triads like here's C, here's this. The next week I was playing at church. Like literally throw in, you got to swim. So wow. started with my father. Mom is a singer, choir director. Started with them at the church. And then I'll never forget, I'm about 10 when my dad started me, 12 when I saw Ty. So Ty ends up coming to my church for a joy night on a Friday night playing with, now he ain't got the choir at this time. This is just him as a musician playing with the local, a local gospel group. Yeah. Imagine Ty, Dana, Thaddeus. Ryan Fraser Moore's on drums. Oh wow! Um, so already, I don't know who they are, but they come in and they smash, uh -huh. and I'm just sitting there with my mouth open, like mm. that's I never heard nothing like that before. So from that moment, I made a decision, y'all. I want to play. With, I'm gonna play with that dude one day. Like, got the cassette tape, took it home, practiced it, wore it out. Wow! And you fast forward. That's like '92, '96. Ty starts GA, and I remember seeing him at Ford Memorial. Like, yo, okay, this dude took it to another level. So not only was he playing, now he started a group. I'm supposed to be a part. I'm thinking, yo, so I'm playing with a local group named John Payton and Holiness. Mm -hmm. And we opened for Ty two years later. Wow. Ty, and then Ty sees me. Yep. And from there, Eric Tribbett and me made a connection. His cousin brought me to the rehearsal from 98 to 2008. I started rocking out. I was rocking with Ty for 10 years. And so it was like, it all came full circles like a dream come true. Like I practiced from the age of 12 to about the age of 16, 17. Then Ty sees me. And then I end up coming up, coming, becoming a board to fold. And um, so everything started there. And of course, from there, met James Poyser, the whole Philly scene, Stephen Ford, all of those guys. And um, when I was coming up, the whole Philly neo soul market was really launching, like Music Soul Child, Vivian, uh, Vivian Green, Jill, Scott, all of them. And I just happened to be a kid looking around, being in rooms with these guys. And all the connections came from church. 
-hmm. It was, you know what I mean? Like James Porter, yes, he's a, a neo soul producer, but he was always at his father's church on Oregon. You know what I mean? You always see him at Fort Memorial. You would see little John Roberts, Brian Moore, um, Stephen Ford. They will all be, you know what I mean? Uh, Dre and Vidal, they produced with Jazzy Jeff. So you met them in church and they would invite you to come to the studios. Mm -hmm. Go to the studio, Jill Scott is in there sweeping the floor. Oh. Like, but nobody knew who she was. Okay, okay. She was working on her record. Wow. The first album. Yeah. When her record comes out, you're like, that's her? Mm -hmm. She took off. Music Soul Child. I remember seeing Music Soul Child around downtown Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Just this dude singing, telling everybody his name was Music. I'm like, your name Music? <laughs> And then da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, when that comes out, yeah, yeah. take off. Uh -huh. And I'm like, it's crazy to watch people from the beginning literally go from, I see you every day and now you're on TV, you're on BT, you're famous. And I mean, I, I was at the beginning of a lot of, and so I ended up being a musician for a lot of these people because I was there at the beginning of a lot of their careers. Yeah, yeah. And um, just kind of rode the wave. And then Ty came out in the midst of that. And just took off from there, man. And it, it was, I can't even tell, I got so many stories, like just, it was so much fun. I, I didn't get to go to college, so I felt like that was my college years. Uh -huh. Being in that stu those studios, being in a, a, a five spot in Philly. Oh uh, man, we had this thing called Black Lily, um, where Jill Scott, uh, uh, who else, Jaguar Wright, The Roots, um, you would just, anybody would be there. It, Vivian Green, Flowetry, would be performing on a Tuesday night. Now, I was underage, so I wasn't allowed to go into these venues. Yeah. But we would sneak in in the back, come up on a stage, play, and sneak back out. Like, oh, wow. like wow. but I built, I learned everything there. Like, between church joy nights and those, we you did both of those together. And it just kind of, and all of the guys that came out of Philly came from that. Derek Hodge, Blackstone. Omar Edwards, June, James Poyser, Dana, all of us came from the same school. Wow. We were all together. And James Poyser and Stephen Ford were like the godfathers of that. Like okay. James Poyser the soul, Stephen Ford the church. Okay. And um, we all, we just learned from that, man. It was crazy. Yeah, that's amazing. So you were playing for Ty about like six years in to playing keys in general, right? Just no, 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 no. So I would, when I started playing with Ty, I was, I was about, about eight, maybe about eight years. Ago. Okay, 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 okay. Yep, yep. So about six. No, you're right. No, six. God, wow. I'm doing. So he wrong. he heard you at six. I, I think is what you're saying. He heard me when I was at the six year point of playing. Oh, wow. That's crazy. Yeah, and That's then crazy. he took me under his wing at the eight year point, and from there, him and Dana just beat me. They just like, okay. I was schooled. They schooled the smack out of me. Like them two. Yeah. Um, of course James Poyser. Yeah. Um, but. Dana and Ty, man, they was hard. They was hard on me. <laughs> it was, yeah, yeah. that was super hard. I heard, I, heard, I heard Ty talk before about being hard on his keyboard player. So I can only imagine. Because he played. So yeah, it was like, people thought I was his MD because he always picked on me, but it wasn't, I'm like, nah, he wasn't calling because I was MD. He was calling me because he wanted me to um, step up. Parents need you to do this. I would do this. You need to do this. You know what I mean? If I'm directing, I need to hear a certain thing. Yeah, and yeah. so he was hard on me and it was, I mean, I'm so grateful for it. Like, cause he, I mean, the stuff that he threw me in the, he threw me in the water. My dad did the same thing. So I think, you know what I mean? My dad took me as far as he could take me, got me to a certain point and then Ty took me to another point. You know what I mean? And just kind of kept going from there. Yeah. Yeah. That, so. that, that, that's amazing. So it, it's funny cause I had a similar start. Um, I had just started taking some lessons, but I'm just learning, you know, C, D, E, a couple of things. And mm -hmm. my dad started a church and he was trying to get a musician at um, the bigger church that we were a part of. Nobody would come. And he said that God, yeah. told, him, God told him, you already have a musician. And so wow. he didn't know who God was talking about, but he's like, must be my son. So I'm, I'm okay. right out in the water, just start playing, barely, like <laughs> figuring my way out as we go. But yeah, it's very, really yeah. similar. So, uh, that's how you grow bro yeah literally literally it's, yeah. they don't do it like that no more though it nah, ain't like that nah, nah, it's nah. it's that's what i'm trying to teach some of these young youngins like not even to knock them but they everybody asks how you grow how'd you learn like that i'm like man it's like they throw you in a deep end of the pool and tell you to swim yeah and you pretty much fighting for air like literally and back literally. then it was devotional yeah yep. so 
devotional, you don't know what key they're going to play. You don't know what key they're going to sing. And you better not touch that transpose button. My dad would tear me up if he saw that that button lit up. He saw a plus sign or something. Yep. Yo, you got plus five on here? Oh, you ain't playing. Yeah, I didn't even no. know about that at first. <laughs> right, right. But you know, you just try to make it through in devotional. So you figure that that five plus five minus. Yep. Man, nah, my dad ain't play that dog. He got on me. You need to know all your keys. Mm -hmm. So it was it was good. We learn how to play in all the keys. Just devotional service, really. Devotional, straight up. Yeah. So I I know I know starting out and even till this day, you you were like a really you practice a whole lot. So who were your influences? Like, I mean, I know you talked about uh, the scene in Philly, but outside of Philly, who were you listening to that influenced you? Uh, so Chicka, we didn't get to listen to a lot of music outside of gospel in my house growing up. Yeah. Um, some jazz made it in my house. George Duke, Chickaria, okay. some ha Herbie Hancock. My dad loved Earth, Wind & Fire. So I'm like, dad, Earth, Wind & Fire is kind of crazy. But to them, he was like, they got to pass. So we listened to them. Mm -hmm. But um, so Chickaria was big, a big inspiration. But for me, John Peters was big in gospel. Yeah. One of my favorites, uh, Melvin Crispell, John Peters, um, Noel Hall, Fred Hammond's camp. Um, yeah, yeah, I love Noel Hall. Um, Daniel Weatherspoon was huge. Oh. Um, I remember hearing Aaron Lindsay with, um, was like TM Mass or something way back in the day. Okay. Kevin Bond, obviously. Oh, yeah. Um, Thomas Whitfield was another one. Um, but the Winans was like, Winans and the Clarks was like my favorites. Like the Clark sisters, I, I didn't even know that was Twinkie. I just knew their sound. I love their sound. Yeah. I was a big fan of the Winans. Um, Hezekiah Walker is another one. Um, everything Hez did, I love. Yeah. Um, and of course, James Hall. I mean, those were the main, um, influences. And then I got, I got hit to Joe Wilson with Natalie Wilson, SOP. Yeah. When I was about 16, 17, okay. I heard Joe for the first time. And he just kind of messed me up. I had to have a double, a double keyboard set up. <laughs> me too was another one too with John P. Key. Let me, let me oh, go back. Yeah, John yeah. P. Key was huge. Um, those guys were, you know, uh, uh, Ivan Powell, late Ivan Powell was a huge, I loved him. Um, um, actually, Hubert Powell. Oh. I remember him him having an instrument, uh, like not really ever hearing instrumental records from you know what I mean? On the gospel side, yeah. hearing him was big. But um, yeah, there was those were influences, Stephen Ford. Um, but John Peters, I tried to transcribe John Peters. Okay. Like I was trying to my bit when I heard him do that uh James Hogg was it according to record, whatever that was, I'm not the same. I'm like, I'm trying to figure out how to play all the stuff that he's doing. Cause I've never heard somebody play so free in gospel music. Yeah. No. Um like you, you let you letting him riff on these records, like jazz riffs on these records, that blew my mind. Um, John Peters, Joe Wilson was big. Those two guys um, that I, I specifically try to transcribe. Um, and then later on, I got into Yellow Jackets and Weather Report. Okay. Um, yeah. As I got with Ty, Joe uh, uh, Joe Zawana Restaurante became huge for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've definitely I, I've I was at a the reunion concert actually, and um, I was backstage and I heard I forgot what the 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 young man's name is, but he's like ten or so. He's a drummer, and Ty was telling him, "Make sure you listen to the Yellow Jackets." And and yes, so I know yeah. I'm big on that. Ty and them flooded me with that when I came, because I had never heard a weather report. I heard a Yellow Jackets. I heard Yellow Jackets music, but I didn't know who they were. When I got with GA, they like filled my catalog up like Paris weather report and I became a weather report head like mm -hmm. oh my god everything heavy uh, heavy weather records uh study all of that stuff yellow jackets and the crazy thing is I actually got to hang out with Russ Ferrante a couple times oh wow um we ended up doing shows with Floor Tree Floor Tree and Yellow Jackets on the same bill wow and show gets rained out so we didn't get to do the show so I'm in I'm hanging out in Russ Ferrante's room Whew. And spending time for hours with Russ Ferrante, Jimmy Haslett, Bob Minster, Marcus Baylor was playing at the time. And we're sitting in the room letting them hear life before everybody heard life. Oh, wow. That's so crazy. they, Yellow Jackets heard life before everybody did. And we sitting there talking to them like, y'all are heroes. And they're listening to us like, you guys are bad, man. And that Yellow Jackets and Soundcheck hanging out with each other was crazy. Like, wow. 
I wish I had video of that. Like it was ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but Russ became a mentor after that. I would just call him sometimes, and then he would give me advice. And he became a like, yo, I got this guy. Like, as a mentor for a couple of years, he became a mentor. It's crazy. Yeah, that's yeah, that's really crazy. And it, it, it's funny you were talking about like how you were only allowed to listen to gospel for the most part. That that's the type of house I I grew up in. So I missed out on all that. <laughs> the crazy thing is. Last year or the year before, I was talking to my dad. Um, I, I don't know why I asked, but I was like, do you know who Herbie Hancock and uh, Chick Career are? He's like, oh yeah, I went and saw them live when I was younger. I was like, <laughs> I was like you could have- tell me. Started. Like what? Well, I mean, my, my dad my dad was, didn't grow up saved. So like once he got saved, he kind of like tried to leave right. all that stuff. I was like, you knew about them. Same thing. I had to figure it out late in life. Yo, my dad told me he went to a, a Herbie and Chick concert where they had two pianos back to back. And he told me about that. I said, you were there? He said, yeah. He said, and Chick got and was playing the strings and stuff. Yeah. I said, what the heck? Like, you should have took me to some of that. But at right. the time, same thing. Like, he wasn't saved yeah. when he was doing that. Mm -hmm. And then he got saved, got off the streets, and then became a pastor and was like, just changed his life. So exactly. he was trying to shield me. But I'm like, I don't think he thought he was going to have this musician on his hands. So right, 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 right. crazy, right. man. Yep. Yeah, but so you... You you're an '80s baby, but you grew up in that '90s era. So this is a, this is a kind of like a funny question, but um, so I, I I personally believe that the '90s era of gospel was like the strongest. Like there's bigger hits, more classics from prior to that, but I feel like just Fred Hammond, like you mentioned, John P. Key, Kirk Franklin coming up, Hezekiah Walker, Clark sister still doing their thing, Karen Clark share coming out. Yep. Um, just just endless endless groups, endless people, and everybody had their own sound. But for you personally, would you say music wise and gospel, would would you prefer the 80s era or the 90s era? Whew, that's a great question. Um man, the funny thing is the 90s was so strong, like because the industry got stronger. Like 80s was real raw, 80s was real grassroots. Like yeah, I yeah. feel like Gospel music in the 80s didn't, didn't have the industry together like that. But it was a lot more pure, I yeah, believe. That's true. That's true. So I think 80s gospel was a lot more pure in heart. They were writing for, I feel like they were writing more for relationship, in my opinion, in that time. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what you hear from the 80s just has a different heart to it. But the 90s, it just hit hard. Like, oh yeah. I think everybody from the 90s learned from the 80s artists. Yep. Like the John P. Keys and the Freds and the Kirks, Yolanda Adams, all of them, like they were, and everybody had a sound. You're right. Like they had, everybody had a camp. Yeah. So it was like, John would come with a camp. you like, oh my God. Fred had a camp. You know what I mean? Everybody, you, and then, um, now I heard Kevin Bond talk about the 80s differently. So he made, because they were grown in the 80s. We were kids in the 80s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They may see it differently, but for me, the impact for me was on the nineties was um the nineties just had a different impact. It just hit differently. Um, I you know, in my opinion. Um, and it felt like to me, the eighties felt like it had more family. The eighties felt like more family artists. That's true. Situations Wynans, like Wynans. you know what I mean? Hawkins, Crouch, Winans, Clarks, Pay Sisters. Yeah, it was yeah. like they had those. And then in the nineties, you start seeing these, these um these musicians lead the front, lead the charge, like musician turned artist, Smallwood. I mean, well, he 80s too, but he's still kind of, but you had John McKee, Fred, Kirk, these jokers that get just flat out write and play and they created their own sounds. Yeah, yeah. The night, I mean, the nineties, uh, it's my, it was my favorite. Um, the nineties made me want to be a musician. Literally, yeah. Now I'm studying the eighties now though. Like I've been okay. studying more eighties stuff now. Yeah for what I'm doing now. So yeah. I'm listening to the whinings now more, even though I listened to them in the eighties, I wasn't a musician. I was just a kid swinging my feet uh -huh. in the nineties. I became a musician. So I was listening in the nineties and I didn't want to hear nothing old. I wanted to hear everything new yeah. in the nineties. So I was trying to get out of devotional, out of traditional into the new sound, synths, aux, yeah, yeah. Teddy Riley world. We were trying to get to that, that new Jack swing vibe, um, production, all of that. Um, now, when I go back to, I listen to 80s for songwriting. Like, yo, yeah, yeah. Commission, so, Fred's yeah. pen was dumb. Like, Mitch, all these, their pen 
Marvin Winans, their pen was crazy. Yeah. Like Andre's catalog. I was like, wait, what the heck was I? I, was, I wouldn't I was, even listen to that. I was watching that. Funeral Today, man. It's crazy. It's crazy. Crazy, bro. And it just changed. So the 80s is influencing me now. 90s influenced me then yeah. a lot stronger. But 80s is influencing me now. Um, and 70s. Yeah. 70s just had a vibe, like yeah, yeah, for sure. The disco. If you just want to get a vibe or get a groove, especially with neo soul vibe, like stuff like that, you yeah. can just go pull from the 70s and just That's you'll true. be it, you'll be on. Don't it, don't it don't matter what record you turn on. Yeah, you just turn still, one record on, you got some hits. It still works for today. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. So what what would you say your favorite gospel album of all time is, if you could think of it? Sheesh, you are killing me right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so right now, um. I'll say the gospel album that, that has been on repeat the most consistently is the Winans Tom uh, Tomorrow. Okay, album. okay, okay. The impact of that record for me. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's like that record. I'll give, I'll say three records and, and I, I it's, this is hard. Cause I, I mean, Pages of Life, Oh man, that's mine. That's mine. Pages of Life transformed me. Like that was the that was the record when I sat down in front of the TV and watched from top to bottom, and I wanted to be a part of that band so bad. Man. I wanted to be. I had my XP50, and I sat in front of that TV screen, the VHS, and from the top of the the joint, I saw the young boy they had playing on it, Jason Jordan. Mm -hmm. I never forget he was playing the organ, the uh, Roland VK Seven, and I'm like. Who the young boy on the organ with the chain that keeps swinging? And every time he bop, I'm like, yo, how he get to be up there? I just wanted to like, I wanted to be the young boy in the mix. And I just remember watching that. And I'm like, from top to bottom, that album to me was flawless. Like the flow, the musicianship, the energy, like the production. I ain't never seen gospel done on that level, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and it was just, oh my God, that was, that was to me, that's a favorite. That was a very on repeat record. I think tomorrow that record, um, Kimberrell's Everlasting Life oh, yeah. is yeah. probably the most repeated album. Um, and then there's another album that I'm gonna say, and and it tends to be forgotten of, but I think it's one of the greatest gospel albums I've ever done, most flawless records. And I believe that's Byron Cage's record where uh uh, uh Byron Cage, the presence of the Lord is here, that yeah, record. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. one of the best gospel albums I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. From top to bottom, like just a great search experience. Like, yo, you turn that record on, you you it's anointed, it's skill, yep. the quality, the singing, the production. It's just the to me, like that record was a flawless record. Yeah. Like those four, like I could legit keep going back to. Um, it's more than that, but yeah, that yeah, tomorrow yeah. record is my forever. I go back to that record all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah so yeah those are absolutely incredible records like like you said timeless and, and as i mentioned pages of life is it for me like that's that the songwriting the time yeah is, it, and i mean fred's my favorite artist but that 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 record is just crazy yeah I was, yeah I think it was this past sunday i was listening like man what was he thinking like you are uh you called me friend and um uh. your love and uh Man, it's, it's, it's just crazy. Don't pass me by. Don't pass uh, me by. What? All, all of those songs. Yo, he was in a vein. He literally he was. He this anointed vein. Like, Fred, it was like, yo, he was, at one point, he wasn't missing nothing. Like, at all. At all. It was like, all his shots. Like, 96. Like, yo, everything he does is working. Yeah, from that intercourt. purpose by design. Yep. When he did those records, he yeah. just hit a, a vein and he just never stopped. Like, yep. He was just going crazy. Oh, that dude. And I mean, he's, he's still on my bucket list. Yeah, yeah, I played yeah. with him one time, um, Calvin, when Calvin was MDing and them, um, they came to Israel's Deeper. Oh, and okay. Calvin was like, yo, rock out with me, with we and Phil. I'm like, oh, bet. I knew the songs. Like, yeah, you yeah, kidding yeah. me? I was in that organ, like Jason B. Jordan. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on there, I was on it with that same, I'm living out my childhood dream right now, playing with Fred. Like, yeah, that was, that was crazy. But Fred is one of my favorites, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I wish I could have seen that, but. Yeah, so you you mentioned these these albums, but you know I, I don't know if you're purposely doing it, but the you you excluded the stuff that you are part of because especially in this generation, I think everybody would agree that Victory Live 
and life oh, wow. and standout were all classics, timeless records. You go back and I'm still shaking my head like, what were they thinking? So, all right, so you, you, you briefly talked about life and how I know that was a studio record. And mm -hmm. I heard you mention before that you guys actually recorded it live, which is crazy to think. Yes, yes. That's, that's I wish they would release that. Um, but we would need to edit some stuff, but. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So when life, but when life came out, the day that life came out, we did a live, we did a lot, like, you know, you release party, but it was a recording, a live recording. And so we did a live recording of life. Um, at the Phil at the TLA in Philly, and that was the crazy experience because the TLA is a secular venue. And it's a, it's a you know it's a major venue in Philly that mad tours go through. Um, most gospel artists don't ever perform in there, um, so we did it there, and the line was around the block. Man. And South Street in Philly, you know South Street is famous for this cheese sticks and all that stuff. The, the people on the block, like we ain't never seen that concert space have a line on the block like that. Wow. They're like, what is this for? It was like a gospel thing. Like what? Yeah. Gospel don't do this. Yeah. So the line was out the door all the way down the block. We do this event. If you ever seen the Bobby Jones on Bobby Jones, when we would do everything, they had all black on with the suspenders uh -huh. and um, white gloves. We did no way. That was from that recording. Oh, um, okay. But they only released those two songs from yeah. that recording, yeah. not the whole thing. Um, but we got a live version of every time to get, I wake up. We got a live version of all of that stuff that never saw the light of day. I still have it. I just don't, I can't let nobody hear it. I get in trouble. I get in trouble for it, but it's so raw. If, if they decide to release that as a special edition one day, that's one of those in the vault records that like, we'd probably be 60 years old and they play it like later, like, yo, this is a, from that time, but that was a, that, there would have been another re live record if, we, if they would have released that, if Sony would have released it. Yeah, I would. There would have been another live record and be before Victory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, so I, like I said, I was at the reunion, so that was crazy. So I could only imagine how that life live record would sound. Oh. But I, I, we'll, we'll, I'll, we'll talk offline, I got yeah, you. Yeah, 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 <laughs> all right. <laughs> but yeah, so. <laughs> So, so, all right. So then after life, you did victory. And um, what, what, what church was that at again? For deliverance. Oh, deliverance. deliverance. Okay. So yep. that, that record was just crazy. Like the DVD, everything. So I just want to know, cause I know you're talking about being nervous at NAMM. How nervous were you back then? Oh. This recording? <laughs> well, that was way worse. I can, I can only imagine. I <laughs> was way worse. Cause um, I don't know. I I'm not used to, me coming up with my father, our church was a relatively small community type church situation. Yeah. So I wasn't privy to industry, to crowds, nothing like that. You know, a good crowd coming up in our church is like 100, 150 people maybe. Um, yeah, yeah. So I got with Ty, it was a different thing, like attention. Man, that request. So if the Life Live was lying around a block, Victory Live was 5,000 people in over a thousand more people outside that couldn't make it in. Wow. The fire marshal wanted to shut us down. Wow. Now, mind you, so we rehearsed for months for this recording. We prepared for this. We went through some crazy tragedy within the choir. We lost like one of our, our tenors. He passed away. Um, Pudge, his father passed away. Our saxophone player's mother passed away. It was crazy. So that's kind of what really, that was kind of part of what kind of created some of the theme of the record when you heard, I want it all back. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. was kind of coming from that angle. We had suffered a lot of loss. So we were dealing with that, a lot of prayer, preparing for it. And we don't know what to expect because most people don't pack victory out. I mean, don't pack deliverance out. Okay. Deliverance is a 5,000 seater church. It's one of the biggest churches in Philly. And most people can fill the floor. If you do a good, if you fill the floor of the church, you're doing good. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. we was nervous, like, well, we know we're going to have a good night if you fill the floor. Just make the cameras cover the floor so that nobody can see the balcony empty or nothing like that. Man, we opened them doors. People, it went, people couldn't sit because there was so many people in there. We were like, and then it was over 1,500 people outside that couldn't get in. So we come to the stage and if I'm looking out at the audience and you can see Warren Campbell, Aaron Lindsay, um, Israel, um, Mary Mary, Kim Burrell, uh, Don McClurkin, Hezekiah Walker, then you look over here and you see Teddy Riley. Why is Teddy Riley like, and Guy is standing over there. 
Yeah. And it's just, and then everybody we can imagine, James Fortune, all these different people, this is before anybody knew who James Fortune really was. Yeah. Everybody could think was there. And so automatically my heart coming out my chest, like, and for me, what made me nervous was, now we had prepared for this, but what happened was there was a song that night that Ty was supposed to play that he didn't play, that he asked me a couple hours before. He pulled it like a Whoopi Go Gobert sister act number on me, like, yeah. yo, I'm not gonna play this song tonight, Paris. You gonna have to play it. Like, wait, what? Wait, dog, you've been rehearsing this. I ain't, I only like maybe touched it once or twice. So I had to go back and get on the piano in the room and learn it. And that was who else but God. Mm -hmm. He was supposed to play that. I wasn't supposed to play that. Man. And if you that, know the way that thing changes, keys. Yeah, I was gonna say it ain't no easy song. He was directing me. So if you notice, he was directing me because I didn't know. I was like, you gotta cue me for when to change because I got a vague understanding of where they're supposed to go. Mm -hmm. And this is not a normal. You know, if it's two keys and we're just playing back, cool. No, we jumping from A flat, B flat, and then B flat, E flat, and then going back and forth. Every and he got these awkward moves in between. So I'm sweating bullets because all I'm I'm prepared for everything else that night. I'm like the song that all eyes are gonna be on me right. is the one yeah. song I don't know Vocal like that. Hmm. And then all my heroes is out there in the audience. So I'm like, yeah. dog, if I bot if I botch this, this is my career. So I'm nervous all the way up until who else but God. And that's like the middle of the session. And it's a very highlighted moment yeah. where it's just me, the vocalist and Ty. And so we get to that point and I'm just following Ty sweating bullets. Like once the song is over, I rested. And then I was able to play the rest of the session. Cool. But I was shook up until that point. Once that was out the way, I was like, all right, cool. I can get through everything else. But, um, but we were sweating bullets. The sound wasn't good that night. Um, we walked away feeling like we lost the Super Bowl that night. Oh, wow. Like, none of us spoke to each other wow. when we left. Really? Everybody got in their cars and disappeared. And we didn't talk for like a week. Oh, and I remember wow. Ty, Ty called us all to the house. Dana called the band, Soundtrack come to the crib. And they pulled out the raw files and played it. And it was way better than what we thought it was. Oh. We thought we failed. We thought we bombed. Oh man. And because what we expected, what we rehearsed, when this, you, if you can't hear your sound and things is all over the place, yeah. you like, we, we, it felt like we scrubs and we didn't know the audience didn't know. We thought the audience was like, man, these jokers. We, we, we didn't know how to feel. When we listened back to the playback, we like, yo, this joint ain't bad. Like, okay, we had to edit some things, but we only had to cut one song from the record. And it was uh, a song with Donnie McClurkin we did, oh. which was subsequently probably the best song in the album that y'all never heard. Oh, wow. The song was crazy. And You Are God. I, heard, I remember it too. And You Are God. It had like a Phil Collins type vibe to it. Wow. So I know did, Ty got uh, the files. Y'all did a Judy, uh, Judy song too, right? They that did. was on Standout. Oh, Standout. Okay, okay, okay. That got cut too, yep. Okay, okay. So, all right, that leads me to my next question. So you were that nervous about, um, you know, performing in front of this big crowd. Getting through that, um, did it help you for standout? Like, did you feel more confident or were you nervous? Oh yeah, no, standout way more confident. Um, definitely, um, we did more, we did better preparation the second time. So right. the first time when we rehearsed for Victory, I think what people don't understand is when you do stuff on certain stages, how you rehearse is usually how you perform. Yeah. So we was rehearsing in us in his dad's church to in PV amps with a 61 key motif. And then I go to record on a on an 81 key, a 88 key yeah. new motif. I wasn't rehearsing on that the whole time. Oh, so right. it feels different. And then you're not rehearsing with in ears, you're rehearsing with an amp. Yeah. That change the, the, the changes the texture, how you approach. You know, I'm hearing Spanky differently in this rehearsal, but live is sounding different. So yeah. it affects your confidence. It does. So when we did stand out, we made sure we rehearsed at a rehearsal hall with monitors, with ears, the way we were going to record. So by the time we got to recording, the dynamics were all similar. And so it didn't, it didn't rob us of our confidence. Um, we were a lot more secure. In fact, when we did stand out, we finished so we by the time we got to the end of it, we were like, hey, we done already? We wanted to keep wow. going. Wow. And we did a beach party recording the day after as well. Oh, really? So 
Standout was just like, yo, it was, we, was, we, were in a, we, we were in an overflow in Standout. Mm-hmm. Whereas in Victory, we were like, yo, did we, did we get it or not? We didn't know until we listened back. Mm-hmm. So I was way more confident, still nervous. But once we started playing during Standout, we was good from mm-hmm. the first song. We was in there and then, and you watched it, if you watched the video, we, we did way more on the video than made it on the actual yeah, CD. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We were just more free. And I, I think I was too busy, to be honest. On, on a, I feel like I was playing too much. On the record? I was, it was so fun. Like, Love and Crispin was playing, like, you yeah, playing yeah, with yeah. your OG. So I was so, I was doing so much that I think I had to actually go back and overdub and tame oh, wow. myself on the record. Cause yeah, yeah. it felt good that night, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So. I, I heard from a lot of different people that you guys used to get together on like weekends and Saturdays and just rehearse the whole entire day. Is that is that is mm-hmm. that how pretty much how it went? I mean, not it, any day, but um, but we definitely did those days. We did those um, Mondays was our days. Like Mondays was our main like rehearsal nights. But we would definitely have those random like tired. We go to the basement. We used to have a studio called the Mud Spot. Sometimes we just go in and just push red, shed for hours. Wow. And out of those sheds will come these instrumental arrangements, shouting cuts. Mm-hmm. That was that was something that we would do for hours. Shouting cuts and arrangements. How can we flip these shouting cuts? Do yellow jackets and shouting cuts, throw weather report wow. and shouting cuts. And then um, and we would do that stuff, not necessarily for a specific thing. We would just do it and just build up a catalog of, of inf- inf- information. And then we'll go out in a gig and we'll call it. Yo, let's do that joint we did that other night. And we'll just randomly pull stuff, de- depending on where we were. Mm-hmm. So we didn't always have a set when we went out. Like mm-hmm. it would just, we would fill the room out. Mm-hmm. We know you get into a room and you got like 10 groups on a group on, on a program and everybody's doing shout music. If they doing shout music, we're not doing shout music tonight. Yeah. We're gonna do this. Yeah. We'll go left. You know, if they doing this, if the spirit is here, let's go here. Yeah. And we would intentionally change up whatever our set was according to uh, the, the wherever we was ministering. It was, and Ty was, Ty trusted the band like that. The band trusted Ty like that. Like, yo, parents, go out there and play some B flat minor. Huh? Just get out there and play some B flat minor and then Spanky jump in and fill in. And, and we were like, okay. And sometimes we'd be creating right there on the spot. And people would think it's, when did you ever rehearse that? Right now? <laughs> like, we just... <laughs> Wow. Ty had that kind of confidence where he just trusted. We had that, but I think it was just a relationship. Like we all trusted each other enough to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I feel like that's the importance of a unit because you guys spent time together. You knew each other. You were like family. Yep. It, it's, so it's no accident yep. that you guys are like one of, if not the greatest gospel band ever. And here we are okay. almost 20 years later, still trying to catch up to what you guys were doing back then. Man, it's all friendship. Yeah. Any any band um any any band that has has even when I talk to the Fred it's crazy because I talked to the Fred Hammond crew who mm-hmm. did that Pages of Life stuff. I remember working yeah. with Noel Hall and I remember we was working on a record and I'm in the hotel room with him like, bro, number one, I can't believe I'm with you, Man. but tell me the stories. Yeah. And when he would tell me the stories, it sounded a lot like our stories. Yeah. The relationship. Yeah. They were brothers. Yeah. Fred Hammond's band, they were brothers. When you talk to the guys who was rocking out with uh, with John P. Key back in the day, they were all brothers. Yeah. When you hear all the camps, Kevin Bond, they were brothers. Yeah, the Hawkins fam, they were all brothers. It's a it's a theme. Like you want to build a sound, build a relationship, mm-hmm. and the sound comes out of the relationship. And um, that's the that was my that's the main thing I, I miss about my guys. All of us are grown now. We all live in different places, um, but we literally. Dog, I can't remember sleeping on every, we all slept on each other's couches. Mm-hmm. You, I mean, be in the basement, we just spent time. I mean, just, and we didn't know what we were, none of us knew we were gonna do what we were gonna do. We didn't know what, what was gonna be. We just knew we loved each other and we loved what we did. Yeah, yeah. And out of what we did, the love, I think that was the most powerful thing of Ty's ministry, if anything, was the love that we all had for each other. It had nothing to do, you know, the music was great. We love God, but loving God only means one thing, if if you don't, if you love God but don't love people, I think we missed the whole point of Christianity in our walk. Oh, yeah. And I think church is really big on looking up to heaven, but we don't know how to look at each other and we don't know how to love each other. Right. And I think that was the main takeaway for me with Ty was the love. Like those jokers, my brothers. Like yeah. to 20 years later, I love these guys and 
me and Spank got something coming up. Oh, I ain't wow. going, I'm not going to speak. I'm not going to speak on it. Okay. But we'll, so I'm excited about some new things on the horizon. But yeah, but it's family. You know what I mean? That's what it is. Yeah, that's what's up, man. So um, yeah, like like I said, it's, it's crazy how revolutionary you guys were. Because I mean, I know bands did hits and stuff like that and like crazy arrangements before you guys. But you guys had a particular sound that influenced people to try to catch up with that. And then, of course, the bumps. You guys like revolutionized <laughs> shout That's music. tight, boy. Yeah, man. He, so, he loves his yeah. bumps, man. You put Ty on the organ and he going to automatically push it. I'm like, you go, we, we going to shout. Ty's on the organ. We shout. Oh, oh my yeah, God. Yeah, yeah. Like, that dude, man, it's crazy. Yeah. So around 2008, after Stand Out, you, uh, I, I heard you say before that God told you to leave the band. Talk mm -hmm. about that decision, how hard that was. You guys Sheesh. were like right, right at the pinnacle of success and everything. And all of a sudden, like the rug gets pulled out from under you. Yo. So for me, I had been embarking on, on, um, the work on this cartoon idea I had been working on. Now, I always like would be, I'd be on a tour bus with a sketch pad, computer working on artwork. Um, but I had this vision and it hit me so strong. And I was trying to do this vision with the group, but it wasn't something that really was, was for the group. Um, I, I mean, I got a cartoon that I was developing for, for GA. Like after we did Victory, I started developing this cartoon called Kingdom University. And it was like basically X-Men, but spiritual, Mm -hmm. warfare type vibes so i had this vision but it really wasn't the vision that ty had so um it really started that started kind of lead me all you know lead me down a different route but um about 2008 we, we recorded stand out we did the whole recording we were editing the record um overdubbing and getting it ready and i just remember and i just remember having a dream and i'm like god what in the world does this dream mean and lord let me know he's like your season is up I'm like, I'm like, no, nah, I'm good. I don't want to hear that. Anybody trying to, are you crazy? Like, we about to release this record. I'm, I co-wrote Every Little Thing and Be All Right with Ty. Like, so that's about to be the single. I'm like, let's, you telling me at, this thing is about to really launch and we know where we, I know where we, Victory had already put us at a certain point, mm -hmm. but Stand Out was about to go to another level. Yeah. And at that point, even I got to a place where I was getting paid what I wanted to get paid financially. I'm at the place I want to be career-wise. Wifey's singing and traveling, so she's another one of those. She's yeah. she's doing well. We yeah, yeah. so I'm like, and the Lord was like, it's time. And so he was speaking to me and he was speaking to my wife. Both of us was feeling it. Wow. And we didn't say nothing to each other. So I never forget one night my wife was like, I don't dream. And she she's the dreamer. If I dream, I know it's important. I know it's something. Yeah. So that she woke up the next morning, looked at me like, I'm like, what's wrong? She was like, What you dream? I was like, I ain't dream nothing, girl. Get out of here. So I kept moving. The next, th throughout the day, something came back. I said, babe, I had this crazy dream last night. And in the dream, the choir was mad at us because they found that we was leaving. Wow. And she started crying. She was like, God, she said, God, let me know. She said, but he needed to let you know. And I'll never forget having to tell Ty. It was like the hardest thing to ever. And it's funny because at that time, I was trying to tell him. And me and him, could. it was playing phone tag. We could not get in contact. It's like, you talking about somebody I talk to every day. Yeah. And all of a sudden, Yo, we voicemail, we can't, you know. And so I finally get him on the phone and I'm like, bro, I don't like, I don't want to do this on the phone. I want to do this in person. But I said, but the but the urgency is there. So I let him know. And then we sat down and talked. And I was like, the season is God is calling me out, man. And it was like, man, when you've been with somebody for 10 years and mm -hmm. and you, man, we did everything together, traveled together. He was my best man in my wedding, the whole nine. Oh, wow. Um, his wife, my wife's mission of honor, like we're close. And you're telling your best friends, God is calling you away from your best friends. Um, it was difficult. I remember that last rehearsal, man. It was like waterworks. All of us, everybody was in there like babies crying. Um, and, you know, every, you know, wished us well. But we walked, me and my wife walked away and went into a season, of, a wilderness season. And I really had a hard time, man. I, I was mad at God for a while. I'm like, God, are you kidding me? Like, and... I understand now why he called me away one for my family. And that year was the year. What happened was my wife and I have a heart had hard pregnancies and we had lost our first baby while we was on the road a year prior. Mm. Um, we knew we couldn't have build a family on the road like that. So the year, I mean, literally I left 2008, the end of the year, my son, my first son was born. Mm. 
-hmm. And he was in the incubator for five months. So it was necessary that I came off the road for his life. Yeah, yeah. And we had to fight for his life for five months, surgeries, all of that. And it was like, the Lord was like, he gave me my son the year I walked away from the group. And so a lot of people didn't understand that it was really personal. Um, and it was the beginning of me building my family. Yeah. Um, I was doing it, me and my wife were married for four years on the road, but he was like, it's time for you to build your own. Yeah. And that's what the whole thing was about. And it started me and my wife's journey and a family. And it began me launching out, you know, into ministry. I became an ordained minister the following year. Yeah. All of these different things kind of like got set in the motion. God was really moving me into my calling. So that was the real draw out. It had nothing, you know, people thought, is it another opportunity? Is it? No. Nah. God was really moving me into another place. And, you know, even me and Ty reconnected later. And he was like, man, I respect what you, the decision you had to make. You know, no, none of us could see it for you, but you had to see, you had to hear God for yourself. And um, it was hard, man. I mean, some days I'm like, dad, God, like, I felt like we had more that we could have done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the same token, God knows when you're comfortable. I was comfortable with GA. Like, low key, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do all the other work and the other people I work with after that, I probably would have been comfortable. Like, I'm good. We, we kept doing records, but I think I had to grow. He had to stretch me as a producer, as a songwriter. Yeah. And then, of course, in 2009, I connected with Israel. Yeah. And I started that relationship, and then all, a bunch of other doors opened from there. Marvin Sapp and all these other records, Myron Butler, start producing and writing with other people, which I probably wouldn't have done yeah. um, had I stayed where I was. I think people were, a lot of people was afraid to touch any of Ty's musicians back then, too. Yeah. Like, Nobody, people wanted to work with us, but nobody wanted to, yo, Ty, can I, can I hold your keyboard player for a minute? Like, nobody yeah. wanted to do that. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it was taboo in gospel. Like, we don't, you don't touch the, somebody else's guys. But um, when I left, all the people was like, vroom, vroom. it was like, mm -hmm. oh, we, we wanted to work, let's work. And I'm like, you knew who I was? I was just the quiet keyboard player in the background yeah. and didn't know you was, people was watching credits and knew, you know what I mean? I wasn't a networker. That wasn't my thing, so. I didn't expect nobody to remember me after I left. And God had a whole different plan. And opened up, bro, the, the year, it's crazy because I mourned that whole year when I left. I was mad, like God. I would see them on videos. Larry Farmer was playing, my boy Black Surfer started playing. So yeah. everybody thought I was him and me, and he was me. <laughs> I kept getting phone calls, yo, this you? I'm like, no, that's my boy, that's not me. So I'm like, I'm missing out. And the Lord was like, just chill, I got you. Mm -hmm. The first two phone calls I got within the first two hours, within a year of me leaving the group, was Aaron Lindsay. No, no, it was Jerry Harris and Adam Blackstone. They both called me within an hour of each other. Wow. Jerry was like, yo, can you go to Africa for me for Israel? Wow. I'm like, yes, man, of course. And then in an hour, Blackstone called me and said, yo, can you come do the, uh, this Janet Jackson hit with me? Wow. I was like, Yes, what? <laughs> so it was like, I went through a, a humbling and then God opened some doors and exalted me and blessed me from there. And it's been nonstop from there. It's been a blessing, bro. So wow. God is good, man. It, it was a rough transition, but God will bless. If you obey, he'll bless you. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man, that's amazing. So, all right. So you, so, you know, we talked about Janet Jackson, but like Israel is more of a permanent gig for you after that. So how's it going from Ty, who's a staple in gospel music, but has a very unique sound to Israel, who's another legend that has a unique sound as well, but it's totally different, I would say, from Ty's sound. Like, how is it adjusted? Very. Oh, man, that was, um, <laughs> it was a learning curve um, because I think because Israel is such a household name mm -hmm. in the church. Like, when Israel came out, like with Ty, everybody can't sing Ty stuff at church. It's too no. specialized. Yeah. So you can do the bumps at church, but you can't really do, you're not doing no way at church for yeah. praise and worship. You're not doing, I want it all back. You're, but yeah. you're doing Lord, you're good. Mm -hmm. You are doing friend of God. You are doing, so I generally knew Israel's songs, but playing somebody's songs for a church service is different than when you're playing it for them. Mm -hmm. So when I came into Israel's situation, it was like playing with Ty got me in the door with Israel, but I, I was still a freshman. So I had to learn and I couldn't do what I did with Ty with Israel. So I can't give Israel Neo soul chords. Like it ain't, yeah. I can't Lord you a good here. I got to play like Aaron Lindsay. He's big. Uh -huh. Aaron is big chords, big changes, big moves. I got these little behind hands. Aaron's <laughs> one hand is like two of mine. <laughs> so Israel doesn't call me to play aux, which I thought was going to be the case. 
he calls me for mains. Mm. So I come in, I'm on piano. With Ty, I'm playing five, six keyboards. With Israel, I'm playing piano. So it was an immediate shift in mentality. And I clashed a little bit in the beginning because I'm, I'm trying to be Philly. I'm trying to be Zawanal Philly with yeah. Israel. And Israel needs me to be Aaron Lindsay and not be Aaron, but still respect the sound. Yeah. So I would clash sometimes and I'm like, I am playing the parts and there's like, that ain't it. That ain't, you know. And so I had to literally humble myself and find out. I, I'll never forget, I asked Israel, I said, bro, what did you grow up listening to? Mm. What was your influence? Because mm. I can hear what you're doing. I can try to play eh, eh, exactly what you're playing. Oh, my fault. No, you good. My battery's about to go out. Okay. Um, but I'm saying I could play the, the basic changes, but I want to understand what's behind it. And then he started giving me, okay, I listened to Billy Joel growing up. I listened to Elton John. I said, okay, now I'm listening to those. When I listen to the way their piano plays, mm. oh, okay, it has a different language. Okay. Then I started listening. He was like, Andre Crouch was big for me. So I started going back into those records and listening to the antics of those players. Yeah. So I started adopting those types of playing into my playing. And then I noticed when I would play the gig, Israel would look back at me and crack a smile. Like, oh, wow. You get it. Yeah, now yeah. you understand my language. You understand. And then when I gave him his sound, he would give me leeway to add mines. Oh. And I started becoming a part of the, uh, the sound. You know what I mean? I was like, I started becoming a part of the group and part. It took a while for me to kind of like really assimilate into it. But I had to learn, I had to stop trying to do what I was doing in the old season and learn what they're doing. And once I added that skill set to me, I grew. It, I noticed my skill as a piano, as a pianist grew. I started dominating the piano in a different way. I wasn't just thinking like a aux player. And now I'm thinking like, just flat out, how do I lay out this whole, you know what I mean? Cover these, this ground. And that grew me in a, in a very unique way, an interesting way. And uh, even from an international perspective, just to culturally, um Israel helped me to like understand other genres um the CCM culture all of that it was just it was definitely um an eye opener and um I'm I'm grateful for the for the growth that I had man I've been with him since from 09 to 16 for the most part um I was rocking out for for, for about that amount of time um yeah, yeah. and did, a, did did some records as well right yeah I came so power one they just did power one when I came okay which that record was freaking crazy yeah, yeah, and then yeah. jesus at the center Man. was the record that i didn't get to play on but i was in the band at the time that they did it okay they had like too many keyboard yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, was yeah. like, it was a lot of people that yo that record buddy strong chris it was chris baker me buddy kevin camp wow. um it was like four or five keyboard players aaron Lindsay, all of them and so i'm like i was sitting at home like i'm the only one that didn't come in for the recording for this one but I pretty much had to tour that whole record, all of that stuff. So, yeah. and then we did cover the live in Asia, which was, yeah, yeah, which was crazy because like all you though, right? Yeah, mains on that, me, Leonard, and, and Chris Baker. Okay. Um, but what was crazy? This is the crazy thing. Most people don't notice. We did that record ten years to the time that they did it alive in Africa. Oh, okay, okay. But this is what's crazy: when they went to go cut alive in Africa. Israel and Ty was on the same gig before oh. the, the, the day before they flew to go to Africa, wow. right? Aaron Lindsay walks up to me when at the gig. It's the first time, my first time meeting Aaron. He walks up to me and he's like, yo, I see this huge dude. I'm like, I know who he is. He's like, yo, can I pray for you? I'm like, of course. Like, yeah. and he prayed, this is his prayer. He said, Lord, Lord, I pray for a double portion of what's on me to go on to him. He said, Lord, I pray that my mantle goes to him. Wow. When we did cover Alive in Asia, we were rehearsing in Burbank. After rehearsal, Aaron didn't, Aaron didn't really have his hand. He produced the record, but he didn't really have his hands on it. Yeah. He came into the rehearsal to watch us rehearse for it. And he was like, y'all got it. Y'all don't need me. Mm -hmm. So then I got in the car with him after that. And he sat down in the car. And he came to me. He said, yo, he said, do you remember when I came up to you? and prayed for a double portion to be on you. He said, I did not know that 10 years later, you will be sitting in my seat. Wow. You're the first keyboard player to play a full, if you ever listen to Israel's records, usually people are switching out on mains. Moving. Yeah, moving, yeah. On Covered, I'm the first to play a full 
record mains other than he was. Wow. 10 years to the time he laid his hands on me. Yeah. Oh, it was all manifest. His prayer manifested yeah. where I manifested doing cover alive in Asia after they did cover alive in Africa. And I'm sitting playing mains on that record. Like, and then that record won two Grammys. Wow. So a double portion. Yeah. Of what yeah was, literally. Wow. It's crazy. Like wow. his word, it was like, yo, I, he said in the car, I pretty much cried. Like, yo dude, like I, cause I thought when I walked away from Todd that I had lost everything. Yeah, yeah. And he was a very key, he was a very key person in my life that spoke life to me and, and prophesied over me. And his prophecies came to pass. Crazy, bro. Wow, that's incredible. And then, like, of course, you did you did an amazing job on that. I was hoping there would be like another follow up live record that you could. Play I know, with. man. That that record, I know, bro. That record was great. So, all right. So you have a whole lot of experience with recording. What what? A two part question. So first, what would you say the difference is in being a session musician and a live musician? And then what would you say is the difference in being uh, preparing for a live recording and preparing for a studio session? Wow. Um, definitely session being a session musician makes you a lot more. Um, you pay attention to details a lot differently. Um, um, I have a lot more than when you're a live musician. You don't have as much restraint as you do when you're a session musician. Like, what you know, I mean, before I started recording, and you know, when you listen to a playback, you're like, that was me. Oh my God, no. Like, I was doing way too much. Um, being a session player, even when you're playing live, you're thinking, I'm thinking about how it's going to play back. Mm -hmm. So even when I get hype and the energy is there, I'm still saying to myself, no to a degree on some. Like I said, when I did stand out, I was just busy because. Number one, I got Melvin Crispo. I'm thinking Melvin Crispo, John Peters dynamic and how they did. So I wanted to be like them. So I was really trying to get that dynamic off when I had Melvin. But other than that, normally when I play sessions, I play with a lot of restraint. Um, um, one, I learned when I did Marvin Sapp's uh, Here I Am record with Aaron and them. Yeah. Recording with Ty was a lot different than recording with those guys. Because um, with Ty, we had months to prepare. We were a part of the creation of that material. When I did the Here I Am record with with, Mark, with uh, Aaron and them, Aaron and Buddy Strong brought me in on that. You only had a week to prepare. Oh, wow. So it was like, I'm used to spending time with music and getting it in your system and second nature. With them, we got the, we may have gotten the music maybe two weeks before the recording. Then we come in on a Monday, uh, come in and rehearse Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we do pre-record, Friday, actual recording. Mm -hmm. That was something completely new to me. So that means you got to know your parts, your programming, everything. You got to still, and, and still perform at a high level. I was shook when I came in for that. Um, number one, because I'm walking into a room with all my big brothers, Calvin Rogers, Swole, mm -hmm. Rick Watford, Aaron Lins, and they had already did the Never Would Have Made It record, which wow. was one of the biggest records in gospel. So good. I'm coming in on a follow-up. And then when I come into the rehearsal, mind you, Aaron brings me in. He has me arrange three of the songs. So he's like, rehearse them while I go rehearse the vocals. I was like, you rehearse who? <laughs> you want me to tell Calvin what to do? Yeah, yeah. You want me to tell Rick Watford and Swole what to do? They're my big bros. Like, I'm the young boy. So I, I go into that rehearsal with my tail between my legs, trying to tell Calvin. So Calvin, um, right here, hit the ride right there. And uh, <laughs> Rick Watford. So I was shook. I told Aaron, he walked in, he was like, yo, how's it coming along? I really didn't know how, what to tell him because I didn't think I was doing good. Them jokers were so professional. Calvin was like, let's go. <clears throat> they was they killed it yeah. as if I helped them do anything. Yeah. Um, but they taught me to, to, they taught me to work very fast, very efficiently. Don't second guess yourself. Um, and um, do your best when you do recordings to not have to overdub. I found out that Calvin don't be overdubbing, Buddy don't be over, don't have to overdub. Uh, Daryl, uh, Daryl Freeman, they don't. Oh, these jokers are like one take wonders. That's crazy. Like when they do, when they record, what you get in that night is what you're gonna hear on the record. Wow. And I mean, I'm used to going back, recut myself ten times over, uh -huh. and they learn the art of like literally going in and cutting one time. Uh -huh. It saves you time. It saves you money. It saves everybody. You know what I mean? And and it, and, it, and, it, and it keeps the the record honest. It's yeah, a live record. That's true. That's Most true. live records we listen to is not live. It's like overdubbed like crazy. 
everything. Um, so live, uh, live, live playing live versus being a session player. You, you, you do a lot of your prep work up front. You just really do a lot of your homework up front. You know what I mean? Really focus down and hunker down. When I'm preparing for live recordings, um, I usually have like a template um, approach. If I'm, if I'm the, I folk, I do things different when I'm an MD producer than when I'm just the player or aux. Aux is a different type of preparation than playing mains mm -hmm. um, versus, you know what I mean? When you play aux, you program in multiple sounds. You know what I mean? You're playing multiple instruments and you got to really be, you know, be on your game. Um, a lot of artists don't know how to communicate to aux players. They don't know to tell you what to do. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. a lot of times when you're the aux player, you're coming up with what to do. Yeah, so yeah. you're really creating. But if I'm the mains guy, usually I'm like, okay, I'm doing all my homework. I'm coming to the door for the most part, um, covering everything. And then if I, I'm always have my mind open to help add something to the picture, like I'm always ready to throw in suggestions, whatever. Um, but, um, but everything is prep work up front, man. Like I flood myself with people's music before I got to do it. Like if I know I'm going into a session, I got shutdown days. Like yo, a, a couple, you know, a week or so before, I'm like all I'm listening to is this material mm -hmm. before I'm going into the rehearsals, and I try to know everybody's part if I can. Um, that makes drums, sense. bass, keys, guitar, because you're playing on top of these people. Like, yeah. you got to communicate to these instruments. Um, and I find knowing those people's parts, patterns, even vocals, helps me to know the patterns of songs. Like, um, if you know what the singers is doing, I know for the most part how to communicate. Um, I always act as if I'm MD, even if I'm not. Yeah. You know what I mean? Try to try to function that way. Um, you learn as you, if you learn as, as if you're an MD, then you, you, most likely you'll come in ahead of the game and you'll help somebody out. They don't gotta say a lot to you. Um, mm -hmm. Me and Jay Drew work like that a lot. When I do the stuff with Kiara, yeah. when I work with them, whatever Jay send me, I learn that. Um, and then I'm ready to come. He'll tell me ahead of time, Pete, I'm gonna need some interlude ideas. So I already start working um, on some ideas beforehand. Like we did that, It Keeps Happening song. Yeah. Um, I did some arranging on the end of it, like that final key. Won't apologize. Da -da 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 like yeah. going into that vamp, I came up with all those moves because we were just kind of tracking straight into it. But Jay had already given me a heads up, like start thinking of some ideas. Mm -hmm. So when I came to the table, I'm like, what y'all think about this? It, it fit right in there, took the song to another level, key sung it. And it just flows smoothly. And it was like, okay, cool. Like just always thinking solutions, you know what I mean, with these situations. But um, but ultimately, each artist is different. Um, each producer is different. Aaron is different than Mano. Working with Mano, Mano is very, very specific as to what a lot of times Mano will have you like this. He'll put his fist up. He don't want you touching nothing oh. until he figures out what he wants you to play. Mm -hmm. in conjunction with so i had already learned the music when i come to a mano situation and he's like don't play nothing mm -hmm. and i'm like oh, okay but i have i have a picture of the whole picture musically and then i'm waiting at that point for him to give me my parts yeah, yeah. specifically and so you got different dynamics that you work with it's crazy man um so it's, it, it varies man but um i love i mean i love i love doing session work um because I can listen to an album, album to album that I worked and hear how I grow. I've yeah, grown. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like a metric thing. I look at it like, oh, I could have did that better. I could have did that better. Versus a live situation, unless you got somebody recording you back, you don't really, you can't really judge it. Yeah, right, right. If you don't got somebody giving you a, a tape back or something to um to to, to 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 judge it. But this pandemic season is great because I think it caused everybody to have to record. Right, right. Everybody had to learn how to be a session player, mm -hmm. and I think. I'm listening to some people church records like yo dogs is recording records. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Every yeah. week. Every week. Like see, I don't know if you ever watched like uh, uh Evan Bryson and them, uh CJ Thompson and the mug yeah, down. Yeah. Them doing like sessions Session. every week. Like y'all, y'all put out a record every week. What's going on? Like yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's it's it helps you raise your game, you know what I mean? Definitely. So I always encourage that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So You've been all over the world traveling many different countries, continents. Where would you say your favorite place to travel is or that you Ooh. have been to? Japan. Oh my God. I love 
Tokyo. I I love Japan. Um, Japan is one. Um, Africa, uh, uh, South Africa. Um, I love South Africa. Um, it's another place. Always the islands. I mean, you can't go wrong. Yeah, St. Yeah, Lucia, yeah. Trinidad, Jamaica, all of those. Yeah, yeah. Those be lit. Like St. Lucia was one of my favorite shows ever. Did with a, a flow tree hit out there. Mm-hmm. That was like, it was flow tree, yellow jackets, and Brian McKnight on a bill, which yeah. is a weird, like, how do y'all put those three in one yeah. lineup? The show gets rained out. We our sound check gets rained out, and I'm hanging out in the room with yellow jackets that night. So they they all end up going home. The island said, can we at least get a show out of Flower Tree? So they put a show together mm-hmm. at midnight, built a stage just in the middle of the island somewhere. Yeah. Sound. And we rocked out from about 12 to 3 in the morning, a Flower Tree set, but we created a show. Wow. Like, we took all the Flower Tree songs and put reggae to it. Mm. Me, Thaddeus, Spank, Jeff Bradshaw, um, and they just let us play. And you talking about for hours, the people just partied. That was one of the craziest shows ever. Um, but Japan, but Tokyo is one of my favorite places. Like, legit, I hope we have days off when we go there. Wow. And I mean, just the technology. I go into the city. What's name is also really dope. Um, Singapore, amazing. Oh, um, okay. I love Singapore as well. So those probably Singapore, Johannesburg, Japan is my my three favorite places. Wow, that's amazing. It, it's funny. Yeah. I, I did an interview with Kevin Powell. He was saying he he said with no hesitation, Japan number one too. Japan, crazy, bro. Man, I can imagine. I, I definitely got to get out there. That was my first tour spot. I mean, when I was 21, my first time traveling out the country was to Japan. Oh, okay. And I went there with a pop artist. They paid me so good. But the gig got, like, like the main gigs got canceled, but they paid us. I mean, it was like, it was just like, oh, we just went out there for free because the majority of the shows got canceled. Wow. So we were just on per diem enjoying the city. Yeah, yeah. So we was just renting bikes, riding all around Tokyo, going to car shows. I was, I had, I was buying technology that didn't exist in America for years. That I was bringing home. I clothes, fashion. They were so ahead, and I'm, I'm into animation and visual arts. So yeah. I was getting comic books. I was going crazy wow. in Japan. Like, wow. I fell in love. Wow, that's that's incredible. I, I now y'all y'all making me really want to go out there. You gotta go, bro. <laughs> yeah. So, um, how would you? How would you uh, advise a musician that's struggling to find their own sound? Because you definitely have a unique sound. Like when you hear Paris, you know it's Paris. And I would say you don't really sound like anybody else. Even though you have all these influences, you don't really sound like anybody else. So how would you advise a musician, whatever instrument they play to find their own sound? Um, I always say your sound is, a, is, a, is, a, um, is probably, um, think about who you are, like your mom and dad. Like my mom and dad made me. This aspect of me looks like looks like my father, but this other part looks like my mother. Yeah. Like you take on the traits of who births you. Mm-hmm. So my sound is a combination of those people who've influenced me. Wow. It's just a mixture. So you add up, you add my father. My fa- my father taught me to play aux first. So that's why I, I, I lean to sounds naturally. Cause when I was playing with dad, he was mains. I had to play the strings, the horns. I had to, so I naturally hear musically from the sound perspective first, and then I build out from there. And um, but I'm a combination of my father, D'Angelo, uh, Fred, Fred Hammond, Winans. Like if you add those all of those together, those components, um, um make up who I am, you know what I mean? Joe Zawinar, when he goes into his lead sounds and yeah. uh, Russ Ferrante, his his approach his approach of piano and, and voices and, you know, when it comes to Chikoria, his chops and it's like, I take all of those different components. So find one who, who influences you. I would tell a musician to find your influences and take components of those influences and add them. You don't have to have a hundred percent of one person like I'm not a hundred percent chick. I can't do what he does hundred yeah, percent, yeah. but there's aspects of chick. I, I got, yeah, you yeah. know, there's a part of Herbie Hancock got a certain part. Chick ain't got mm-hmm. Herbie's soul is ridiculous. Like his lead solo on, um, on uh, a song he does with Shaka Khan and Dizzy, um, nights in Tunisia is like, a, uh, he does this crazy lead solo, like his aspects that I take from different people. 
that that become a part of my DNA. Um, Daniel Weatherspoon, Jesus is a love song, lead solo is like one of the craziest lead yeah. solos ever. Like, um, and so I'm a, you're an amalgamation of a number of people and things. So you add, you got to ask yourself, who, t- find your influences and take parts of those influences to make yourself. You know what I mean? And then where and then you and you have to ask yourself, what's your strength? Because some of us want to be something we're not. And you'll get very discouraged very fast. Man, I used to hear Mike Burrell and Kevin Bond. I wanted to sound like those guys. I could not grasp that sound. What we are. And on the way, it was, but it was, it was on the way to trying to figure out what they were doing. I was discovering things that was beautiful on the way to trying to sound like that. Yeah. And so I'm like, on my way to sound like Mike Burrell, I found this. Wait, but that's me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. On the way to trying to sound like Chicory, I sound this. And I just started adding on. And every as I begin to add on, and when you what one of the ways you find your sound is by recording. That's how you find it. Like that's true. I started finding a consistent pattern. Like when I listen back to Tide Records now, I'm like, I'm thinking, I'm just doing this now. I'm like, I've been doing this. I've been doing that, been doing that. These are part of these are my go-to type changes. Like me, I'm a one, three, six, two, five, one, three, six, two, five, seven, three. Oh. my fault my fault my phone yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I but i have certain changes i go to that are my go-to movements yeah, yeah and i start discovering them when i listen to my recordings when i listen to my arrangement i start discovering patterns in myself like that's my sound that's my yeah. pattern and then once i realized that was my that was my pattern my, my, my sound and pattern then i started really intentionally using those things when yeah. i write when i produce when i arrange Yo, PJ Morton has a certain sound. You, when you hear him, he has go-to changes, go-to. Yep. Mike Burrell has go-to, you know what I mean? You start mm-hmm. paying attention. Aaron Lindsay has these go-to type movements he does. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, it, it's a part of studying people who you listen to, but also studying yourself. Right, right. Push record on yourself as much as you can. Mm-hmm. And you'll start discovering patterns like, oh, shoot. That's me. Kevin Powell got a sound. Like, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. I noticed that when I hear the, the doobie, oh, they got they got a sound. Like, yeah. There's certain jokers that they they got they got a sound. And then there's certain people who haven't figured it out. Jacob Collier has a sound. Corey Henry has a sound. Um, and study people with a sound and see what it is that makes that sound. Like, you know what I mean? So that's that's James Poison. Oh my God. Yeah. He got a sound like nobody business. Um, yeah. You hear it in all his productions and stuff like that. So uh-huh. That's I mean it's it's just an amalgamation of a number of things. It's not just one thing that makes it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great advice. So uh, I, we're coming to a close. So I know we've been on here for a minute. I really appreciate it. <laughs> That's all good, bro. So you, uh, one one of my favorite things about you is that you're not just a musician. You know, we're, there's you know musicians come a dime a dozen, but you're what I would describe as a minstrel. And part of that being a minstrel is you have an obvious deep relationship with God. Like you, you know, musicians, we like to go live and, and post videos uh, playing and stuff like that, but you'll go live and go for like an hour plus talking about God, having a Bible study, encouraging musicians. I've heard you talk about being a shepherd and it's, it's so encouraging. Cause you know, that's right up my alley. Like I, you know, I I'm a musician, but I, I love God as well. I want to be as close to God um, as possible. Yes, sir. That's, unfortunately not the standard like that's not what you right. see across the board not everybody is like that so can you talk about how important it is to not just be a musician but be a minstrel and have that connection with god yeah man that's um that's everything bro um honestly i won't have no confidence apart from that um i'm an I'm a, i grew up as an extreme introvert like mm-hmm. completely fearful introverted talking was not None of this is what I would ever do when I was coming up. Yeah. Um, but it wasn't until I, I I like literally truly we grew up in church, but I got saved for real when I came to Ty's group. I didn't know that choirs prayed and bands prayed mm-hmm. and read the Bible. Like I we had to do that because we was in church in Sunday school growing up. Yeah. But when I got around Ty and him, I yo, they actually loved the word. I was like, Y'all really be read y'all really read the Bible for real? Yeah. And he would be doing Bible studies in rehearsal and I would hear him share stories about the Bible in a way that I never heard growing up. It wasn't hooping, it wasn't hollering, it wasn't screaming. It was just straight talking. Like 
and he will apply it to everyday life. And it really made me start reading the word. And I started seeing the scriptures. Wait a minute. This means this. I can use this for this. And I start to seek God. And when I never forget, I got filled with the Holy Spirit. I, want, I was seeking the Lord for the, and dwelling in the Holy Spirit. I wanted to get filled. Like I wanted to have a prayer language. When that happened, I, that was when I started hearing God on another level. When I opened his word up and the, the revelations would pop out and it was just like, oh my God. And the Holy Spirit started teaching me. And it wasn't about what made it special for me was when the Lord would deal with me, it wasn't in the four walls. It always was in life. So when God would speak to me, it would affect my real life decisions. Like do this. And then I would walk into a room and I'm in a room with my heroes and I have favor. And then these doors will open. He would tell me things in the scripture and then this would happen. I'm like, so this is real? So I started discovering, yo, you can really walk with God and God will walk, get, he will direct, he will direct your path. He will, I have worked with most people I always wanted to work with, work with most of my heroes. God will put me in places and rooms of influence. That I'm like, I don't know how I'm here. My gift made room for me, but before great men, I started walking with God and found out everything as I submitted my life to the Lord, he would do things. Even in my marriage, the Lord honored me in a way when I got with my wife, we made a commitment not to, uh oh, all these alarms, my fault. We made a commitment um, to not smash. Like, yo, I love my wife. I wanted to smash, don't get it twisted. But yeah, yeah. it was like, when we knew we was getting married, it was like, yo, we make a commitment not to smash, not to do certain things. We were like, God, we want to honor you in this. Can you honor our marriage, our, our, our marriage in this, in that department? Yeah. And when I say the Lord bless, has blessed us in our marriage, in, in ways where I would hear people who have problems in their marriage with it, God's like, man, he covered me because you honor him. And I discovered if you honor God, God will honor you yeah. and bless you. And so I'm avid, I avidly speak out about it because, yo, if you got something good, like if, if, if you was to tell me, yo, yo, I started getting into the stock market and I started trading and yo, I'm making millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. I'm like, yo, what you doing? Can you show me how you do that? Yeah. If you got something in your life that's working, why would you share that? Right. You know what I mean? A lot of musicians don't talk about God because they don't, hey, he's not, they don't know what works and what doesn't work. They don't know where, they don't have that same thing. So they don't testify of his goodness. I testify of what I know him to do. Cause when I pray and I speak to him and communicate and he moves, I'm like, kudos, yo, guess what he did for me? Guess what? So that's all I'm doing is when I, when I speak and teach, it's just testifying of literally what I, my real life, I'm not reading from a Bible that I'm not living. I'm like, yo, I read this, I lived it, I went through it, now let me share it. Yeah. And even my pitfalls, I share my pitfalls and my mistakes as well, because I think you can gain wisdom from people's mistakes as well. So even when I'm off and I'm flawed, I talk about that too. Like God is real. David talked to God about everything. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I, and I saw that he was a man after God's own heart because he, all, he didn't run from God, he ran to God. Yeah, yeah. And musicians, we could have the same effect, the same wealth, the same favor, if we would just run to God, even with your flaws, even when I was cussing and wilding out, I would still do, I would still say it to him. And, you know, of course he would correct me, but like, all right, now, you know, you're speaking a, the language of demons, but yeah. you know, at least I was bringing it to him and he would teach me about even my errors. Mm -hmm. He would teach me about my mistakes and then connect me. Everything in my life, every decision and path of my life that I've made has all come from him. Like, I'm not even joking, not, I'm guessing, no, I mean, literally him directing my path. So um, it's important um, when I'm off with him, my life is off, like significant. I've lost years. If I've taken a break with God, I've, I've seen myself lose years of favor because I got off with God. Like, yo, I just missed five years of this. I'm 40 now. I'm like, you don't want to lose five years because you angry with God or you shut out or you ain't communicating because of pride or whatever reason, yeah. especially when I knew God since I was 18, but you take a couple of years off, that stuff costs you. Oh, yeah. And so I had to get to a place of humility where I took years. I, I had almost, I'll say almost a decade of anger with God mm. from about 30 to 40. Mm. And like, I'm mad at God for certain things and God like, all right, you about to miss it. And I've missed things. And then God, once I came back to a place of humility, just like that, 
favor, just like that, doors, just like that, he fall right back and step. What you got is he'd be waiting for the, the backslider, which is crazy. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. literally waiting. If Jokers would just be like, God, he'd be like, yep. He right there waiting, ready to hear your voice. And mm -hmm. he's so merciful and so faithful. Um, but we'd be the ones missing out. Yeah. And I think a lot of musicians, we so burnt out from church that we so sick of the churchy fake culture that we don't want to hear it from a preacher who I see you riding the bins in the hood while the whole community suffering. We don't respect that. Yeah. But me being a musician first, I can speak to us because I know what we all come from. Yeah. We all know, we understand the same thing. Mm -hmm. Difference is I know what they know, but I've also made a commitment on the other side. And my hope is that more musicians would fall in love with the Lord um, so that he can, pro yo, they have no idea. With the stuff, it's funny because I know musicians who are making it and they don't even realize what you think is making it ain't nothing remotely close to what God has for you. If you would just submit, you think that stage you want is killing and God, like, I'm trying to give you your own stage. Wow. But you want to play on their stage. I'm trying to give you your own. Yeah. You want to have your own, you want to be on their network and I'm trying to give you your own. Yeah. I'm literally doing stuff right now, bro. I can't even talk about mm -hmm. that. I can't believe. And it took a long time for some things to develop. I'm like, God, you really going to do this for real? Like, and I got to keep it hush. And when it all come out, people going to be like, yo, how in the world did that happen? Mm -hmm. Some people will think it's because of my work ethic. It had nothing to do with me. It's everything to do with God in yeah. his favor and, my, and me humbling myself before him. And I'm like, God, I'll stay in a place of humility as long as you, you, keep, you keep driving. That's why I, that You Are Good song, dog, it's a serious testimony of in the midst of all the craziness, God will do some amazing stuff. The world could be doing on fire. And the children of God, I've always noticed in scriptures, the righteous, yo, the plagues of Egypt was going on. The children of God was not going through that stuff. Not at all. They was chilling. They had lights when they was in, everybody was in darkness. They was in light. They had lights. They had food. They was like, locusts was going crazy over there. And they sitting there like in Goshen chilling. Yeah, the yeah. slaves. Yeah. You know what I mean? And we're supposed to, during the pandemic, that was supposed to what be happening with the church. Yeah. And some of us do have that testimony. And I did. Yeah. And it's going to even, it's going to go even further. The, the, the God is about to do some crazy stuff in these dark seasons. He's going to shine on his people who really follow him. And my passion is to get as many people connected while there's grace. While like there's grace. Man. connect right now, y'all get connected, yeah. get into favor with God. He got you. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I'm passionate about that, bro. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it it's, it's an amazing thing. Like, cause we don't hear about this a lot, especially among the musician community. Like, unfortunately I've, I've seen like just musicians just wilding out like older, younger, yeah everything and it's just like all right it's cool we all joke we all play around but at some point we got to get serious about the god that we play music that's supposed to be worshiping him so exactly it's, it's, it's always great to see somebody like you that's somebody we all look up to but you have that connection with god that's like I, when i listen to you i'm like i need to i need to go deeper in my relationship with god i need to know god on that level i need to lay aside these weights and stuff because yeah, yeah. if paris could do it we can do it too so oh yeah and I'm still, yo, and, and listen, that don't mean, yo, it, I, I was tell my boys the other day, that don't mean you get some days, yo, I take a day, it's like, you know how you working on your diet, mm -hmm. you eating right, you in the gym, but well, you take one hard day off yeah. and eat bad, yeah. it feel like that thing cost you, mm -hmm. yo, did I just go like a mile back? Yeah. You know what I mean? You feel like you just got a gut back just that fast. Yeah. It's the same way with your walk with God. I'm, I'm learning to not disconnect to not, you know what I mean? Like, no matter how hard you, like some people we fast and consecrate for a season and then we go back to the carnality. Mm -hmm. I'm learning to live consecrated, less carnal and more consecrated, which is not easy, no. but it is possible. But the, but the reward is no joke, bro. Like mm -hmm. you get prayers through, wait a minute. I prayed and they got healed. Oh my God. Yeah. Like that type of stuff, mm -hmm. cause it's needed. How many times you pray and nothing happened and you so sick, like somebody died on your watch. Mm -hmm. You're like, man, like I wish so-and-so was here. And then when I shifted and I pray, I never forget, I prayed somebody who had COVID, literally. I prayed, my mom and them called me and said, somebody got COVID within two days of me praying. And I mean, I went hard. 
they recovered. Wow. And whether or not it was somebody else praying, over, I believe yeah. because I had put myself in a certain place with God mm -hmm. that my prayer and faith made something happen. Yeah. So I got to put my charge on my thing, but that. No, nah, it's all good. <laughs> nah, <laughs> nah, it's, it, we, we, we pretty much at the end. Yeah, bro. So yeah, man, God is good, man. Man, bro, this, if this didn't encourage nobody else when I posted, this encouraged me. <laughs> like, I, this is a true honor. Thank you so much, my bro. Like this was incredible. Like I, I pray that everything that was said and discussed here today will bless people. It'll change their lives. It'll be inspirational. Cause that's the whole point of me doing this podcast. I want to be able to make change. I want to be able to help people, yeah. encourage people and share, you know, these stories that people don't necessarily get to hear. So thank you yeah. so much for this, man. And yes, sir. Much, much love to you, bro. Absolutely, man. Likewise, love, love is real, man. And yes, like sir. I say at the end of the, the um, podcast, uh, take every day, one day at a time. Always keep God first. Only what you do for Christ will last. Keep it pushing. God bless you guys. This has been the interlude with Drew. My guy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Bro.